So hello to the ladies and gentlemen, dear audience. We're pleased to welcome you at yet another event during International Human Rights Documentary Film Festival, DocuDays UA. I hope you're enjoying your self-browsing throughout the many films that the DocuDays has prepared for you this year. And I hope that you're already familiar with all of our platforms that we offer for you to have the best film experience as possible, as we can provide now online under this quite limited and constrained circumstances we all are. So I do hope that you all remember that you can go to docuspace.org and watch all of the films that we offer and I do hope that you're currently joining us at either Facebook, YouTube or at the docudice.ua site. And today we're about to have another soup with directors. I hope you've managed to take a look at our competition of the short films. There's a very nice and generous offering this year, basically as it always is. But uh, we have a very special conversation today because usually, like from my point of view, short films is something that is the most interesting, the most you know specific, the most to the point in all of the film because it's always a little bit harder tell a very good story when you're limited in time and it's always very interesting how you will find the measures, how you find the means to do that. So today we're going to have a conversation with really great people and trust me I do hope you will enjoy talking to them as well as I did and we will have the representatives of our short competition that you can still watch at DocuSpace but please welcome to our conversation today we have Ivana Prokopchuk and her film that is called A Friday's Monday. Ivana, hi. hi. I'll just hi, everybody. give us away. <laughs> so we have La Celinda joining us with All Cats Are Grey in the Dark. And we also have Arias Parvulescu, Teta Cibulnik and Svetlana Potocka's film Zong. And we have Teta Cibulnik joining us to represent the creative team of the film. Hi. Hi. <laughs> we have Mathieu Volp, who is representing our territory. Hello. Nice to be with you. <laughs> and we have also Emilia Snigorska, who's coming with her film 1991. Hi. Hi, Maria. Hi, so basically you're already familiar with our directors who's going to be participating in our conversation today. Um, I have forgotten to tell who I am, basically. But okay, my name is Katya and I'm going to be the moderator for today's session. I do hope that you know me well from the previous installations of DocuDays. Um, but today I have a very specific mission because, again, speaking about short films might be slightly complicated. You cannot find the common topic for all of the five films represented in our short competition program this year. But we really wanted for all of you, the audience, to get a taste of what it feels like and to give this platform for all of us to talk a little bit about the short films. So I would like to start this conversation, you know, to make it not to say like a quick round of quick questions to all of you, but to start with some uh, general questions that I think we all can refer to, because we have some films that have been produced under a slightly bigger framework than just a film idea. I know that, for example, Ivana and Lasse have their films as the graduation film from the film school. We have Ivana, who has now graduated Kyiv Mohila Academy's Journalist School of Journalism, and we have Lasse, who has been producing his film as the graduation film from Lucerne School of uh, Arts and Design. And I actually wanted to start with you two, first of all. Um, we do understand that, you know, making a graduation film it really has a lot of responsibility in making because it's not only your idea that you would like to show, it's not only something that you have seen and it's not only the story that you want to give to the people, but it's also a bit of limitation and constraints from the school you're under. So how it was for you making this film, whether your school and whether, you know, understanding that it's a graduation work limited you in some way artistically or in other, other way, whether they were influenced on your topic or on the manner of your storytelling, what your school have sort of your works. I would like to start Ivana, Lasse. Okay, um, we'll go with Lasse. <laughs> okay. Um, that's uh, actually a really good question because uh, I was thinking about it a lot and it was happening to me when I was graduating in my final year and we I'm going, I, the school I went to is claiming to be a documentary film school, but uh, we only have a, a shooting schedule for the bachelor film, which is three weeks in April. So this is kind of strange because you start your semester in September and you should 
actually make a film that you are like already know that you're going to shoot a documentary subject for three weeks in April and you have a limited time which is 15 minutes and I always thought yeah this is kind of weird because it's a uh, real life and real life you cannot plan on being exciting in three weeks of April so I was struggling a lot in the beginning and I wanted to make a I have footage of a, a musician friend I have who lives above the cinema and uh, interrupts all the cinema screenings. And I wanted to make a film about him. And it was already December and I had to give in the, you know, the script for uh, some finances and for the school to have my grades and stuff. And I went to a bar with uh, this musician guy and in this bar was sitting a man with two cats and I was, uh, falling in, in love with his uh, appearance because he was there with two cats and in front of a huge uh, glass window and it looked like an Edward Hopper painting. <laughs> and I really like Edward Hopper, so I thought, yeah, I'm sorry, my dear musician friend, but I'm going to ask this guy with the two cats if he wants to make a, if he wants to be in a movie. And he said yes. And within a, a week I had to change everything before uh, Christmas holidays of the school and wrote, write a new <clears throat> paper and to prove that I will make a, not a film about this musician guy, but about this guy with the cats. And in the end, I was really happy about this decision because, uh, because it was a school project, I had a very limited uh, time. Mm -hmm. And I just had to be very quickly when I made the decision to make the film about uh, with Christian and with his cats. And it was but just also, really lucky. But I'm, um, you know, speaking of your film and speaking of your character and his cats, basically mm -hmm. your film gives this really trembling feeling of solitude and unconditional love in the same time. And mm -hmm. you know, he had this like your protagonist. He seems like a person who's really careful about his personal space. I mean, I, I'm a cat person also, and I understand that cats wouldn't mind you being in, in his place all the time. You know, cats just believe you're another human servant going on around there. But for him, was it really tough to work with him? Because in the film, we believe that it's very comfortable that the camera is always there and that you're always there. But as it was for your protagonist, was he aware of another human being being there? And was he okay with you telling his story? Um, he was uh, very okay with somebody being around him because, uh, you know, before we shot the film, I got to know him a lot. We were hanging out uh, for three months. We became friends and uh, he shares all his life on social media. He has a YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook. He's really keen on uh, being a, a person of attention. You know, when he walks around with the cats on his shoulders, he gets a lot of attention and he is aware of this attention. And also this is why he, he loves the concept of having somebody around who is interested in him with a camera. But this was also a problem for our film because he was, uh, you know, showing off like a lot or <laughs> wanting to, in the beginning, he wanted to make a slow motion movie about him and his cats. And we were in the complete different aspect because we didn't want to make a commercial for him, but we wanted to look behind his, uh, you know, behind all this. This was the most complicated part of uh, making this film, but uh, in the end we, at one point when we were shooting at the gas station and he wanted to see our footage, he himself said, oh, this, is look, this uh, picture looks like a painting from Edward Hopper. <laughs> and at this moment, uh, he understand that we don't want to make close up film, but he, we want to make a, you know, a static film. And then he had the idea in his head, yeah, he was starring an Edward Hopper painting. And then we were free to do whatever we want, but also he was free to do whatever he wants. If he wanted to, you know, walk around in the park and uh, show off with his cats, we also filmed this part because it was like for him, in my mind, we knew that we are not going to use this uh, material. But for him, it was uh, being himself. And then, in, then at another moment, we could tell, yeah, maybe Let's play a game for two hours, nobody talks. And in these two hours, he, you know, settles down and 
goes a little step back and in these two hours we got uh, one minute piece of footage we could actually use in the film it was uh, a game with his uh, what he his desires and my desires and everybody else's desires and the desires of the cats and in the end uh, but did he like the film taking. at the end yeah he was really he was crying three times while it was before we published of course we i showed it to him and he was really touched and he was crying and in the end he said uh, this film and the, what who i see in this film is me so this is the moment that uh, i and me and my team we knew okay we are we have the, the the right to publish this film because he is okay with it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wow that's that's a cool thing and like by the yeah, way i think it's the most important thing when I, when you make a documentary that the protagonist it's the only thing that should matter mm -hmm. that the protagonist is feeling okay with it so how many cats does he has now he in the film marmalade um, gives birth to six kitten oh. but yeah but he sold them all and in real life katyusha was pregnant uh, eight months ago and marmalade with two kids and uh, marmalade, marmalade is uh, right now hopefully being pregnant again and then also in real life the the cat who the, to the tomcat who mm. impregnated marmalade he unfortunately died so oh. marmalade has a new lover now well but at least now your main protagonist has an extended family so Yes. But you hope he's much happier than he was, at least at the very beginning of the film. Uh, but by the way, I would like to remind our audience right now that if you're watching uh, us at Facebook or at YouTube right now, you can also ask questions. There is a specific form out there in the comments. You can write all your questions and I will, with great pleasure, deliver it to all of our directors. But before that, uh, Ivana. So now back to you. You yeah. also have this school experience. So was it hard for you? Did it limit you in your choice of topic, in the way you've made your film, understanding that you also have to graduate and make a good decent documentary? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so uh, my film uh, was my uh, master's uh, diploma work, but uh, my university is not an art uh, school. You know, my major is uh, journalism. So uh, my uh, university was m more worried uh, not about the film, but about the uh, uh, research and thesis uh, as a basis for the film. So I was uh, shooting and um, writing a thesis at the same time. Uh, but they don't uh, limit me in my uh, film, I think. But they really like you're telling a very personal story. You're basically filming your family and the way the film is made, the way you're shooting it, it feels a little bit like we're invited into this family circle. Like from my point of view as a spectator, you almost feel like you're a part of the family because you don't see like a fully constructed story, like what is going on. You see only the fragments of everyday reality. Like for example, you start with this, all of these uh, ideas and the renovation going on around this windowsill, but we will never know whether it has been ended or no. But what we see is this everyday life, everyday communication, it basically feels like home. And I do believe that might have been a bit of a challenge for you as a person who belongs into this family and as a director trying to depict reality and make a little bit of a documentary film out of it. How, like how was it filming with your own family and how did your family react to the film in the end? Yes, yeah, so for uh, people who don't uh, really uh, who aren't actors, uh, it was uh, quite challenging to see me with the camera going from room to room. Uh, so at first it was uh, hard to, to them, but um, I understand that uh, uh, camera is uh, uh, symbolic violence, you know, for the people and uh, we should uh, emphasize with our characters uh, as we can and uh, not to rush uh, some situations uh, and uh, 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 I, I lost my soul, sorry. So, uh, 
yeah, it was it was challenging uh, for uh, them and for me also. Uh, but um, uh, I think the way I edit my film, uh, not to uh, for audience not to see them, uh, their faces, uh, it was. Uh, no, they liked uh, this choice, and uh, as for me, it was um, uh, Did you have a specific story in mind when you started filming? Uh, so, did you sorry. Have an, uh, uh, did you have a specific story in mind when you started filming? Did you have a specific idea what it is that you want to show? At first, it was it should uh, be a story about my grandma, uh, but uh, as I was shooting, my parents uh, was uh, also uh, in flat and communicating with her. So I thought, uh, why not to do this as a family story uh, and uh, to tell uh, to tell usual day-to-day uh, -day, uh, story, not uh, as. Uh, uh, unusual hero in unusual circumstances, as we uh, a lot see in uh, movies, as uh, in documentaries uh, also. So I want to show uh, what we all have uh, in our homes, uh, all the situations uh, which may uh, seem boring, but uh, it's uh, our day-to-day -day life. And you also had a very nice uh, trick about it, about the filming that is very relevant in the current situation of lockdown and current time for all of us, because all of the action in your film takes place in a very limited space. We're all basically locked up in your flat. So what was the decision made by? Yeah, it's funny coincidence that uh, now we are really locked up <laughs> in, our <laughs> in our flats. Uh, so, um, uh, I, I wanted to show the, uh, how we are locked with uh, families, uh, not uh, only physically, but uh, at uh, some, like mentally. So uh, we, uh, we all uh, co communicate, we say who should, uh, I don't know, make dinner or make laundry. And it's, uh, Routine, uh, which uh, doesn't doesn't have a beginning or end, so uh, I thought maybe it was better not to uh, came out from uh, our apartment and just uh, as the audience we are always uh, locked up uh, and uh, our, we can look uh, at uh, people, uh, we can uh, came out from flat so. Uh, to make um, viewers more uncomfortable uh, as they can. Well, like, you know, from, from my experience of watching this film, I'd say that it actually made me feel really cozy <laughs> because you see this atmosphere of a flat which you can relate to and it really felt, it really felt like you're, you know, a bit of a homecoming. You basically came into a family that accepted you and I don't understand that it's mostly because of the camera work because you know you being a part of the family and you have been making it as a really family film and family story and was it like a specific decision of yours also not to create your own position as a director because we can see all of the people in your family except from you so we can see everything from your point of view but you're kind of a bit absent you're the part of the audience why would you decide to do that? I was not uh, deciding to do to do that because uh, it was uh, only a result of editing. So uh, when I was shooting, I communicate with my uh, relatives uh, as I talk to them without camera. Uh, I also was uh, on some shots when I was uh, uh, shooting people. So I, I was also there. Uh, you can hear a few of my words uh, in the film also. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was uh, not the choice uh, to show the objective reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. So once again, dear audience, if you have the desire to take a look at all of our short competition films, you have to do that. And while we're still talking, we'd like to ask Teta 
uh, the representative of our Zong film uh, because you're representing now the collective of three authors and you're also making your short film in the framework of the bigger project. You participated mm -hmm. in this environmental camp and you've uh, said before that this film has actually been created because of it. Can you please tell us more how did the idea came into mind? Because what we see in your film is of a different type of documentary. So it's a combination between sound art, video art, the real footage, history, archive footage, all of it. How did you come up with this idea? Yeah, like you said, uh, it was uh, created as, uh, within the framework uh, of uh, a residency project, which was called uh, uh, Climate and Art Labs. It was an interdisciplinary uh, residency, which uh, invited uh, artists uh, on the one hand and uh, uh, climate uh, activists uh, on the other hand, and also uh, there were scientists who were working with the uh, topic of uh, climate change. Uh, so all these people came together and started uh, discussing the uh, topic of uh, climate from different uh, angles. And uh, we formed a tandem with a biologist uh, who was uh, interested in a particular natural object, which was uh, the a swamp uh, in the uh, Chernihiv uh, region, uh, which is uh, one of the biggest in Ukraine. It's called Zamglai. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, me and uh, Elias Parvalesko had already worked with the topic of the non-human. So we had made a film about trees and uh, uh, about the relationships uh, of uh, trees as such and uh, different uh, human narratives about them and how those uh, things interrelate. So we decided to continue this approach uh, in another film uh, about a swamp. Uh, so we and uh, our biologist partner Svetlana uh, went out uh, for an expedition and uh, uh, we filmed uh, the swamp as such, uh, but also we discovered uh, uh, all the different uh, ideological narratives uh, that uh, existed around it, uh, uh, starting from the uh, pre-industrial age uh, when uh, uh, the swamp was uh, perceived as a locus of fears and uh, as uh, perhaps uh, an evil entity that can uh, that represents a threat to humans. And then uh, throughout the 20th century, uh, it was on the other hand an object of exploitation. Uh, uh, there was a big uh, beet plant in that village that that was uh, uh, extracting this resource. Uh, and then uh, when we actually arrived, we saw that uh, uh, there are just ruins left uh, from that plant, and these ruins are overgrown with uh, plants. So we somehow saw uh, a sign of uh, nature taking over in that mm -hmm. yeah but i think you're and, doing it very cool in your documentary with this combination of uh, the current state of nature and you know telling the recreating basically this narrative and this legacy of the swamp that's you know always been there always we hope always will be there and it's a unique ecosystem and how it changed just throughout the, you know, the human point of view because everything that has been changed for this swamp throughout the year is actually the ideological treatment and ideological point of view from the side of humans. But, mm -hmm. And you're doing it in a very good way with the combination of the archive footage and that's your, I think you were very lucky that you actually managed to find the archive footage connected to this very swamp and to this very location. But there's one also moment that really triggered me as, an, as a spectator. In the very beginning of the film, you're, it's not only the footage or the text that you're using in a very good way, it's also the sound design. Because mm. throughout the film, 
and we hear this mild ambient music that actually creates this kind of calmness but from the very beginning when we have this pure nature in the shot we have a very interesting vocal moment a very strong vocalized that like really got me into thinking like what it is so how did you come up with this idea of making this kind of sound design part uh, well this uh, addition uh, of sound happened uh, in the very last stage of editing and uh, we just uh, asked our uh, composer friend to uh, provide us with a track which we wanted to sound somehow unhuman because uh, uh, we wanted to emphasize this uh, otherness uh, of the swamp, uh, somehow to denormalize it, uh, and so uh, he, he said that he has uh, a track uh, we, uh, uh, from the uh, sound point of view. But uh, because it actually it was a real freak out uh, sound like uh, growling uh, <laughs> uh, something. Uh, but uh, actually, it was interesting. Uh, eventually, we found out that uh, uh, what we perceived uh, as a human uh, growling voice uh, was actually synthesized uh, mm -hmm. uh, by special software. So. Uh, it uh, it was made to sound uh, uh, as as if it was human voice, but it was uh, automatically wow. synthesized. So it's like basically non-human sounds, just to emphasize the non-human character of the film, and to actually combining mm -hmm. it, actually amplifying this story of what is the human impact towards the films that should not be maybe managed by humans all the time. Thank you very much. Um, I think well, uh, this being said, I would just to like once again to remind you that if we have any questions, that would be a good thing. And um, basically, uh, oh, we have already some questions, but before I go to that, I still want to pass the floor to both Amelia and Mathieu. And I would like to start maybe with Amelia, uh, because, you know, getting back to the human base <laughs> from the nature, getting back to humans and human nature. Uh, I know that your film has been made with, with in collaboration with the Munka studio, and this is the studio that is really greatly known by Ukrainian directors and Ukrainian filmmakers, a lot of Ukrainian young filmmakers, especially in the short film, they collaborate with Studio Munka and I wanted to ask you partly of how did it felt for you to be working in the framework of the bigger studio on this film and what was the story behind your film because you're talking about memories and very specific sensitive topics that are relevant for already maybe 50 years now and you're given the story of a German girl coming to Poland talking to the Holocaust survivors which you know gives a lot of different senses to it, even if you put it in those three words. But what was behind the story for you? How did you come up with this story? And is it the very story you wanted to tell from the very beginning? Hey, um, I'm going to start with the, I'm going to start answering with the second question. Um, so I met Yeta first, uh, very accidentally, although I am, um, I am a Pole living in Germany and um, being in Poland and in Germany, like I'm having uh, a lot to do with both of the countries. I never planned to go into the direction of the Polish-German history, but it came to me, so I had to live with it. I was doing a research for a completely different project in Warsaw and um, I had, uh, I was calling foundations that I thought maybe can help me with my project. And uh, one of the foundations was a Polish-German Reconciliation Foundation. And um, it turned out they can't help me with my project, but uh, we got into a talk and they uh, told me about the voluntary program and uh, it sounded um, all of a sudden, very interesting to me, and um, and I had this feeling that this is right. If to lead a dialogue between those countries about this subject, then this is the very right way to do this. And uh, I uh, I found out that there is this very young girl 
who just came to Germany uh, to, to Warsaw to make a year of voluntary service and I thought that I really really want to meet her and that was something like October mm -hmm. and she was at that time since three weeks in Poland so I met her and uh, first um, and first uh, we were hanging uh, out together like uh, we got a very close connect like we we connected to each other I was almost twice as old as she was but um, but um, but still already at that time we she was able to make a lot of experience that we could share so um, and at the beginning I, I still was protecting myself kind of of going into the subject of uh, the historical topic and historical relation between the two countries so I was planning to make a movie about the the adultness, you know, like initiating the adulthood because she was 18 in a completely different country. She was struggling with a very strange, difficult language. This was the first time she she went abroad. She started to live without her mother. So uh, so first I was thinking about that until the moment. So I was following her uh, through Warsaw, nightlife and, you know, some parties and uh, Polish lessons and her everyday life in there. Uh, and one day I decided eventually to visit Pani Zosia with her, like to go there to check it out. And uh, this checking it out uh, blew me absolutely away. From this moment, the whole life of Yete, like Warsaw, nightlife, adulthood, growing up, it, uh, it disappeared. And I understood that this is the story. This is the... the, the, the... Yes, so that was December. So in January, I knew that Christmas came in January, I knew I have to make this movie and I have to start shooting now in a couple of months, it's all going to be over. So uh, this is how the movie started. It was quite independently. So there I was with Yeta and with Pani Zosia. And I knew I want to have to, like the, the movie has to be done because this was my inner drive. Uh, but uh, apart from this, I have nothing. So I got a partner, a great partner, Eva Radlewicz, uh, the author, the DOP, director of photography. So there I had Eva. But apart from that, I had nothing. So I started to, I called a, um, a producer, young producer mm -hmm. I knew, um, Agnieszka Dziedzic. Uh, she is leading Koi Studio in Warsaw. And I said, listen, Agnieszka, I have those wonderful women. I would really, really like to make this movie. I need your help. Could you help me? And I had some recordings from the telephone, you know, like, look, this is how Yeta looks like, this is Pani Zosia, this is how they look like when they sit at the table. Are you in? This is basically how it was at the very beginning. And she said, okay, let's try it. Let's try it. Um, and Koi Studio, they have a rental service as well. Mm -hmm. So they had some equipment. So she said, okay, I can give you the camera for a couple of days. Go, shoot, let's have a look how it's going to be. And uh, so we, this is how we started to shoot. Uh, to Studio Munka, we applied the, because they have like the, you have to apply and this is like a quite long process mm -hmm. yeah. until they make the decision if they take your movie or not. Uh, I applied in May and the decision that they are taking the movie was in August. Mm -hmm. So, and we finished the shooting, last day of shooting we had in October. So they, Studio Munka, I was really, really happy that they take the movie that is already, you know, like in the process of, in, it was a work in process. And I was very happy they took us because uh, it's a huge support for, uh, for a short movie. And of course, you, you are able to exchange um, the opinions with very, um, very um, experienced Polish filmmakers, like people you really you watch their movies and, mm -hmm. uh, and they are like your authority. So, um, so this was a great support to the Amunka and I'm, it's also a great support in the promotional work. So my collaboration, I can say the, the collaboration started, you know, the movie didn't start with the collaboration with, with Studio yeah. Munka, but, um, but um, I can only recommend it. I, um, this is a huge support. Okay, and, we even uh, have... Uh, yeah. We have a question from the audience um, about your film and it's basically, it's like a, 
very good question because people always tend to want to know more about what has happened with the people they have seen on screen. And one of our spectators is asking what has, uh, like basically whether Yette from one of your characters, one of your protagonists, Yetta, whether she was able to tell about the stories from, about people from Polish concentration camps in Germany. Like, what was the father destiny of her work? Because she was then working with the survivors of Holocaust and she was gathering that information and working. So what is the back history of that? Is she still studying it? Yet, uh, so the moment she left Germany, she was nine, uh, Poland, the, she was 19 and she went to Leipzig. Um, Leipzig, I don't know the English word for, I'm sorry. That's and <laughs> um, for the city, she started to study and first she studied uh, history and uh, Slavistic. So she continued to learn Polish and studied history. She resigned from Slavistic after a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, but her Polish is getting better and better, I have to say. I'm very impressed that she kept it and uh, she's mm -hmm. still developing it. But uh, she's, um, she, she's very into, into the... She's socially very engaged still and uh, she continues working with the German organization that uh, sent her to, you know, that connected her with the Polish organization. So she's still in the subject. Mm -hmm. um, she was writing quite a lot the stories she collected in Poland and outside from the Poland about uh, fr uh, from Poland about this um, meetings uh, that she made uh, maybe one day she's gonna publish a book I really hope that um, this could happen because uh, she has a she's very sharp in her mind and uh, mm -hmm. I believe she could share a lot of uh, very interesting things with us so she's yeah. very involved uh, socially and in, uh, still um, living in, in Germany, back in Germany. Well, I hope we'll, like in time we will be able to read out this book of hers and it will be, you know, very pleasant feeling when you go into, when you like, you, you have been able to see a little peek, you know, a sneak peek to the beginning of her story. It always been this kind of closeness. Thank you very much. And we also have Mathieu, who's been waiting for us to join our conversation for quite a long time already. And we're slightly shifting into this memory lane. And it actually brings us a little bit to what your film has been also working with. Because in your film, in our territory, uh, by the way, that is available at the docuspace.ua.org, uh, you've been developing this idea and this topic of creating memory, creating as actually physical artifacts of memory for people who have been deprived of that, who have been slightly deprived of their own history and of their own voice because of the conditions they're up to. And you're telling this beautiful story of the people who we might not notice in our environment, also not only in the thousand part of Italy. So it's the people who are deprived of their rights and position and their memory and who would not always notice, who we do not wish to notice and do not wish to remember. And I wanted to ask you uh, how actually it was working in a very closed community because you're working in a refugee ghetto and it's quite a closed one and it was really hard to take photos there, not even actually filming. And in your film you're mostly using the photographs, so it's a there's no like moving images as the film would actually be supposed to do. How was it for you? Whether this creative technique has been predefined by you from the very beginning or you just understood that's the only way how you can tell the story? Unmute your microphone. <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, no, maybe I can just say a quick word about the, the beginning of the project uh, because I, um, the, the ghetto where I was shooting was like uh, uh, 20 kilometers from the city I uh, grew up and uh, I discovered it uh, when I was doing some picture for a theater company that, uh, that was uh, doing a residency uh, about migration because they wanted to create a new play. And uh, so someone from an NGO said to, uh, to the director of the play, 
uh, there is a place that you have absolutely to uh, to discover to to watch because uh, it um, it tells you always to be an immigrant in the south of Italy. Um, so always all they live, and so they brought us to this uh, ghetto that was like uh, far away in the countryside, just near the tomato picking uh, plantation. And uh, for me, it was. Um, I don't know if it was a shock, but I was really uh, surprised because it was uh, a real city, a really precarious city with uh, uh, with houses, with bars, with um, uh, places where people can uh, can uh, can sleep, uh, waiting for the the job in the fields. And it was like very close to the um, to my childhood place, and I have never uh, noticed that. Uh, nobody, uh, uh, no Italian can can imagine that there is uh, some kind of place like that just a few kilometers away from the city. And uh, also, um, after this first uh, day, um, I also checked on the internet uh, for uh, maybe someone has already talked about this place and there was no nothing. So there were no images. And so for me, when there are no images, there is no uh, physical evidence of something that is, um, that is real. So uh, everything was hidden. And so I think that the lack of images was the starting point of the project. And when I go back there uh, next uh, next year and uh, in the summer next year, um, I, I was um, I was um, between, uh, for example, waiting a little uh, a little more time to have uh, funding and to to go there with a the crew, or just to go there with a, um, a picture camera and a super eight camera because uh, it's, it's something that I can do uh, easily because uh, there are formats that I use uh, a lot. And so I decided that um, it, it was better to go there quickly because uh, maybe the place will, will have been destroyed by the authorities, and to have uh, to to bring back to uh, uh, to you know my world uh, some some evidence of this uh, of this hidden reality. So um, I think that. Um, I guess the, the the choice of the format was like uh, uh, um, made by the urgency to to mm -hmm. shoot to shoot, but it was also something that uh, something that allowed me to uh, to shoot there because, um, for example, people were um, not very comfortable to be um, to be photographed or filmed, and uh, when uh, they asked me to uh, to see the my material, I showed them uh, the the old uh, Super 8 camera, and they said, okay just uh, to put what you want because they were uh, they were scared that I can use the footage and to put in on uh, YouTube uh, just after uh, just after my experience so I told them no uh, I have to develop the, the the films and maybe the the movie will be uh, finishing uh, two or three years <laughs> because uh, you, you, you don't already know the the time that uh, shooting with um, uh, with um, with film uh, will take uh, so mm -hmm. I they, they were very comfortable when they saw that I have no uh, digital device uh, and, and also shooting in Super 8 is very particular because um, uh, when you're shooting in Super 8 you cannot be uh, hidden. You have the camera, everybody noticed that you are shooting so it was not something that I can do without their uh, permission. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. But, and how were you basically <laughs> developing the story? Because you're using the still images that are very frank, that are very specific. They already the still images, the photographs that you're using, they're telling the story themselves. But then again, there is the voiceover, and there's the story that is told through your voice. How were you developing that? When did you decide that, like which specific pictures are going to be supported with which specific words? Because it's the hardest part, basically. <laughs> For for me, at the beginning, I had the idea of using the Super 8 for the exterior uh, and uh, the picture for the interior because I had a very um, a very sensitive uh, film for the interior that were not very lightened or that were very dark. So for me, it was like a practical reason. Uh, but after, uh, during the, the process, uh, I realized that it was uh, easy to, for example, spend uh, at, at the real beginning to spend time with the people. And just when uh, I feel that uh, we are close connected, just to take uh, a picture of them, for example, uh, during, for example, we spend uh, three hours uh, under the olive trees, and uh, after I just ask, uh, can I take a picture of this moment because I want to to remember it, and so they were comfortable. And when they um, when the process uh, 
uh, continued, uh, it was easy for me also to ask, uh, can I spend, uh, for example, one hour with you doing my Super 8 film? Uh, uh, so it was not a precise moment, but something that we can uh, do together. Uh, so it, it, the, the Super 8, the uh, animated video, mm -hmm. uh, arrived when we were um, much more connected, uh, that they were more confident. And uh, uh, yes, I think it, it, uh, it was not very planned, but uh, during the process it changed, so. Wow, thank you. I actually want to get into, let us say, a quick round of short questions because we have some questions from our audience already. And this is, you know, this is going to be like it always goes in the talk shows, like the blitz round for all of you, <laughs> because this is the uh, kind of super traditional question that we get. But still, do you have a desire to make a bigger film out of your short film now? Let us divide it into two. Do you have a desire to make a bigger film that's first, <laughs> and if you have the desire to make a bigger film, would you like to make it with your the very same person, the very same people that you have in your shirt? Do you uh, see exactly. it as a full? Yeah. Um, uh, no, in fact, it's uh, it's funny because uh, when you do documentary, you don't know um, where a life will uh, bring you. So, for example, when I started this project, uh, I thought that uh, it would be like a single project. And now I'm working uh, uh, since um, two years with the, one of the families I met in the in this uh, ghetto. And we are doing a, a project about uh, uh, a young guy that is uh, living in Italy, but is from Burkina Faso and he married uh, uh, a girl from uh, his uh, native village. So the, um, the, um, uh, the movie will uh, follow their relationship at distance. Also uh, uh, like uh, exploring uh, all these uh, economic uh, around uh, all these people that are now in Italy or in Europe uh, uh, dreaming about uh, El Dorado and uh, working mm -hmm. and uh, trying to uh, to have a better life here but also the the point of view from the from the families that are um, in uh, that stayed in uh, in Africa and uh, yes the the differences between the two uh, point of view uh, uh, maybe this, this of being uh, here in Europe where they have a precarious job and also to dream about uh, the dream of people that are in Africa and that uh, they are uh, like considering Europe like uh, uh, yeah, like uh, El Dorado, a place where uh, everything is possible, even if the reality is not like that. So, okay, you're actually already working on a bigger film that started with you, the, with the short story. But what about the others? So are you planning on making it, the short story into something bigger than that? Ivana, will we see your family on the big screen again or no? How do you feel about that? Uh, actually, I don't know about the bigger film, but uh, I want uh, to continue shooting. Uh, maybe another short film, uh, I, I don't know. But I have uh, a very fun uh, uh, videos from cemetery where my uh, parents and grandma are talking. Maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe it's not the right time for uh, that uh, short film, but uh, it's very funny, absurd, and I wanted uh, to show it to, to the audience. Mm -hmm. So another short film, possibly about cemetery, growing from the very same project. Okay, cool. Tata, what about you? Will we see the continuation to this collaboration of unhuman topics? Yeah, maybe, but uh, I don't think it will be... Uh, feature-length film, maybe some more short films. And you've already, you've, you've already told me before that you actually have three films in this series and Zong is just one part of it. And you had the previous films about the trees, now you have Zong, which is basically about the swamp, and you have another one on math, math or Yeah. So basically yeah. there is already a series about it. Yeah, somehow uh, these films were not supposed to be related, but they came up into uh, what we call non-human trilogy. And maybe because of the magic of uh, the number of three, <laughs> we consider this uh, project uh, finished for now. But we'll see. Okay, but I do believe there's still a lot of topics that you'll discover. I mean, you have already made some films about the connection of memory and space, which is also an interesting topic that can be derived of that. Emilia, what about you? Are you going to continue the following the story of Ms. Zossia and Yetta? As much as I would like to, it's impossible. Uh, Pani Zosia died uh, oh. last year in April. 
But anyway, everything changed. Yet, as uh, you know, like every, the, 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 there are no same circumstances anymore. But uh, I am working on a big movie now, like on the I hope on the on the feature movie, documentary feature, and uh, I also have two female leading characters in this movie. So maybe you know, maybe this is gonna be the uh, this, the, the, the the mark. It's so a again, kind movie. of a friendship story. <laughs> yes, exactly. They are same age this time and speak the same language. So. Well, okay, that's going to be interesting to watch. Lasse, what about you? Do you plan to make a full feature of a cat man? Um, no, I will not continue working on making a feature film out of this or shooting again. But I will keep, I'm working on a feature documentary right now. Mm -hmm. which has the same, you know, topic, the loneliness and solitude, but with different uh, protagonists and uh, in a different kind of uh, setting. But uh, the film that I'm working on now is uh, inspired or is a result from the short film. Mm -hmm. So it's basically going to be made in the same artistic style because you mentioned that you have been inspired by Hopeless paintings and I do understand there might be the very same predominant style in the next film, or no? Yeah, I really like working with uh, doublos um, in general because I, yeah, I think it's... I like to try to find, uh, you know, the... Uh, the what's it all about in one image and it's just really strange when you're shooting a documentary because you have to find the right moment but I really like it so yeah maybe but also I like to work you know with a documentary and fiction and you don't really know exactly where you are and this is also what I try to do with the feature documentary and I hope it works because it also could not cool like you know i'll keep my fingers crossed because that's always uh, the most interesting thing when you have seen the short films especially a lot of them in before and then you see the feature film by the director and you have this pleasure of uh, you know remembering something you actually understand that you have seen something like this before and you have this feeling of acquaintance it's kind of a nice feeling as an audience but Another question to all of you is, we have a very specific format this year, the online festival, and that's a very different feeling, not only for the audience, but also for the directors. Like, you don't see your film on the bigger screen, you don't see how the audience react, you don't understand when they laugh, when they fall silent, you don't see the real emotions of that. But still, there is the new type of festival that has been created under new circumstances. So how do you feel about being a part of an online festival? Um, how do you feel about, like, for example, this function that we have? And by the way, dear audience, do not forget that you have the opportunity to ask all of the additional questions and leave the comments at our site, at the DocuSpace, through Vialog. There is this small point when you can record the small message. So if you have already checked it out, how do you feel about that? And how do you feel about the online festivals overall? Is there a future for documentary filmmaking at online festivals? Um, maybe I just can say that, um, for example, this crisis made us aware that uh, the importance is to, to share movies. So uh, yes, when you don't have the, the, the cinemas or the, the places where to show, it's better to show them than not to show them because you don't have a possibility to be reunited or uh, to share them live. For, but for me, the, um, yes, the experience to be in a, in a cinema watching something with the, with the audience is always uh, uh, for me, it's always, uh, yes, something very positive because you can listen to the reaction, you can just uh, have a real contact with the public. But yes, um, even if it, when it's not possible, it's better to, to, to show uh, these movies and to, uh, yes, and to share them. So I think uh, online festivals are a good way to react to, to this uh, crisis that is now uh, going on uh, in uh, the, wor the world, yes. Hmm. Thank you. Any other opinions? Maybe some of you have already tried, uh, you know, the dialogue function and you have already had this idea of talking to the audience a bit through the medium of the online dialogue. 
I tried it. Uh, I received uh, some responses to my movie via via DocuSpace Org, and I have to say that I was um, at first I was really reserved, and I thought, how should this work? This is going to be strange. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, so the, the the I got three questions via via this page, and uh, somehow um, it revealed also a very positive side of it because you know when you are on the festival and your movie was just screened, and then you had Q and A, and I have so many people, and you know things are happening, and sometimes a lot of things are also getting lost. You just you know because of so 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 much input you are you are getting, and with these little videos, the audience can leave for you there and ask you the question there is uh, this is so precious I, I i discovered because there is this emotion kept that they have after just have watched your movie and this this is uh, very touching i really thank them to the three they are watching us for those little messages it's very precious i really appreciate it well, I hope that after today's conversation, we're going to have much more views for the short film competition program. And I do know that our audience, you know, is only getting heating up. It's already fourth day of the festival right now, and the people have already got used to the main platforms, I hope. And they're going to be asking more questions and are going to be more interactive with all of their directors. And I hope that, you know, now having this opportunity to meet all of you, almost in person, <laughs> They will definitely go and would like to watch a film. Uh, so I would like to thank you for being here with me tonight, today still. I'm really, really grateful that you've agreed to participate in this kind of online format because it's something that is very new for all of us and we're really grateful for your participation and your readiness to do that. And we're really grateful for the short films that you've created and I know, fingers crossed, I hope that the creation of your next film is going to be easy. It won't take a lot of emotional stress and efforts, even though it always does, but I do hope that it will be easy and nice. And I really, really, really hope that we'll be able to see you at the next edition of DocuDays UI. Maybe next year, when the borders are open, we'll be able to get you to Kiev and you will also be able to experience the Ukrainian audience as it is, because, you know, Ukrainian audience and especially the DocuDays UI audience is very good. And you'll be also able to check it after this session because I hope that after this session we're going to have a lot of people watching the short films. Once again, dear audience, remember that we're speaking about the short competition and you have been now talking to Ivana Prokopchuk and Friday's Monday. You have been talking to Lasse Linda and all cats are grey in the dark. You have been talking to Teta Cebulnik who represents the trio of of Lias Parvulesko, Teda Cebulnik and Svetlana Potocka and their film Zong. We also have been talking to Matthew Volp and his film Our Territory and Emilia Snegoshka with 1991. And I really hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I do. Thank you all very much for joining me today. And I would ask to ask all of uh, the other people enjoying Docu Days to keep on watching our sessions because we have a lot of things planned for today. There is still the Docu class after our session, half an hour after us, we're going to have the big rights now discussion on education in Crimea. And later on, we're going to have another premiere of Ukrainian national competition and we will finalize and close the days with happy hours, which is the perfectest DJ sets for your relaxation and father work. So even the directors, if you don't have time to party, you can make yourself a homemade cocktail and join us with the DJ set. It's really kind of fun and cool. So thank you very much once again. I hope to see you next year in Kiev and hope to see you throughout the festival. Just, you know, come to the DocuSpace org, answer the questions that the people will live. And dear audience, don't forget to vote. This is the most important thing. There is five stars over there below every film at DocuSpace and it's really important for all of us. So thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you soon. Bye. 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 Thank you.